The other day I did a complex inlay design on a fretboard. It took me three minutes to cut the inlay design. It took another probably 25 minutes to cut the pocket. Then I held my breath and I took that piece of inlay, flipped it over and pressed it in to the pocket and it just snapped right in. There were no gaps. It was perfect. So what used to take me hours and hours, we're talking several days of tedious cutting with a jeweler saw and routing by hand, took me less than 35 minutes to do it with the X car. That's a game changer. What's up and welcome to our new interview series called Design Carve Sell. Now these episodes are gonna feature the stories of how people are starting and growing their business with the aid of CNC technology. My name is Brandon and I'm on the team here at Inventables. Inventables is the company behind the X-Carve and the X-Carve Pro, our CNCs, as well as Easel, the world's easiest CAD CAM software. So Easel's gonna help you design your product, then our X-Carve, X-Carve Pro, or a bunch of third-party machines are gonna help you carve your product, but you Usually the hardest part of that entire process is who you're going to sell that product. So in this series, we're going to focus on the sell part of design, car, sell. And to kick us off, we're talking with Chris Mock of Highline Guitars. And Chris has sold a whole bunch of guitars. He combines technology like CNC's with old world handcrafted techniques to create one of a kind, one off guitars you haven't seen anywhere else. And this crazy steampunk design is actually one of the first ones that I saw from him. And I definitely knew I had to bring him on into chat. We get into a bunch of things like how CNC can help you reduce your overall labor cost. How do you price to where do you get your first sell? And how do you grow a business in a niche that is already pretty crowded? Now, before we get into how Chris started selling guitars, let's find out how he actually built his first guitar. I want to uh, to welcome you, Chris. Thank you so much for jumping on and chatting with us. Excited to see how you have built a business selling guitars, also teaching people how to build guitars too. So you do yeah. some pretty cool stuff. I'd like to rewind it a good ways back. How did you just get involved with the making things like it's like the music piece did that start before the making or how did that I played guitar just you know noodling and I did that for a number of years and my son who he was about I think eight or nine he asked me if he could learn to play guitar so I said sure but of course I didn't want to buy him a really expensive guitar and have it be one of those flash in the pan hobbies so I bought him a cheap guitar and he started to learn to play and then after about oh two years, he was, you know, pretty obvious he was going to stick with it. And he came to me and asked me for a new and better guitar. I asked him, what kind of guitar do you want? And he said, I want a, a Gibson SG Angus Young signature model. So I took a look at it and that's a $2,500 guitar. So I said, if you want that, you're going to have to save up a lot of money. You're going to have to put away all your, your Christmas gift money and start mowing lawns and shoveling walks. I had made toys for him when he was a little kid. So without missing a beat, he asked me if I could build him a guitar. And being the, the dad who wants to inspire, <laughs> I accepted the challenge and I built a guitar and I enjoyed the process so much that I decided to build another guitar. And I just kept doing it. And I would build a guitar sell it, and then use that money to fund the next guitar belt. So it was like a self-sustaining hobby. And after a couple of years of doing this, I was cleaning out my computer and I noticed that I had created hundreds of designs. So I started thinking, maybe I could turn this into a business. I could sell these plants to people who want to build guitars. And at the same time, as part of my effort to promote what I do, I had created a YouTube channel and, and just was going in that direction. So I started selling the plans and I was building the guitars, doing the YouTube, and it's just grown from. Yeah, yeah, you're doing a lot, which is really interesting. There's a different, different, a couple different angles I want to ask you about. But even before that, going back to when you're building the first guitar for your son, so did you just have a, a normal kind of workshop set up? Yeah, or I, a... I had a small wood shop. All, most of the, the tools in my garage, I just back the cars out, pull the tools out and, and do the work that way. And over time, I had acquired a drill press and a bandsaw and a plunge router. And then I added a belt sander, uh, a joiner and a planer. So I was building everything using 
what I would call a, a modern traditional techniques. I was using, I wasn't doing it with just chisels and, and a bone saw. I was using power tools, but everything was guided by hand. It was still the old fashioned way of building things. I hadn't gotten into CNC yet, but that was something I started to really look at seriously. Yeah. So how did you learn to build a guitar? When my son asked me if I would build him one, I had no idea how to build a guitar. I knew I had to do some basic woodworking because I had done other projects in the past. But what I did was I, I went to my local library and they just happened to have a book on how to build your own guitar. I ended up buying a copy of that book. And that's what I used to learn the basics of the woodwork that's necessary to build a guitar. So that's how it started. And there was a little bit of resources on the internet that I could rely on to answer some of the questions that the book didn't answer. But one of the things I found was when building guitars, there are so many details that people don't talk about when writing about it or teaching classes. There's just lots of little details and things that you have to get or can go way wrong. And that's why I, ch I created my YouTube channels because I wanted to try to share the information that people aren't getting from the books when they try to build a guitar. Yeah. So when was that first guitar? What year? Oh boy. Just did a video on that where I was talking about, I happen to have that first guitar right here. And it was about 20 years ago. I don't remember the exact year. So it was probably 1992. 93 was in, something in that range. Highline came along about five or six years later. Because I, I was doing just selling stuff. I tried Etsy. I did a little bit on eBay. And then I found Reverb in Chicago. So I started doing guitars through Reverb. And it was probably around... 98, 99, I started to think, okay, I got to brand this. So I came up with the Highline name and created the website and did all. When you made your first uh, guitar for your son, go into that next step of I can make one and sell it to someone. I feel like that's a pretty big hurdle, actually making money from the things that you make. How did you start getting those like initial sales? The initial um, effort was done through eBay. So I would post up a guitar on eBay. And at the same time, when I was building the guitar, I would shoot video of the process. And I was also sharing photos on, I was on Facebook at the time, Twitter, and I was sharing those photos and it updates as I was doing this work. And so then people would see it and they would email me and ask me more details about it. Or in my videos, I would point them to eBay channel or to my eBay store so that they could check and see what was available. And that was how I was marketing the guitars. So were you working off of commission or would you just build like a spec guitar and then sell it? What was that? I'd spec my own guitars. I was doing some commissions and as my notoriety increased and people knew who I was, I started getting requests to build commission instruments. And the thing was, is I really wasn't too keen on doing commissions. I wanted to build guitars that I created that were my own design, my own specification. But those commissions started coming in and some of them I, I couldn't ignore because the money was too good. So I accepted those commissions and I started building quite a few guitars based on those commissions. And that continued and up until recently when I finally decided I'm not doing the commission builds anymore. I'm just going to build guitars that I design and create for myself. How were you initially pricing? How are you figuring out how much to, to sell what you're making? When I'm going to build a guitar, I'll spec out all the parts, the materials, everything, and then figure out what that's going to cost. And when I was doing a commission build, that would be the deposit. Since I've stopped doing that, that just rolls into the price of the guitar. And in the past, when I was building guitars using the bandsaw, the router, and, and drill press and all that, my labor was a big part. For most of the spec builds, I kind of got down a process to where I knew exactly how much time it was going to take me to build a guitar. And 
it was generally based on what I was going to charge hourly. It was coming out to around $1,500 for the labor plus the cost of parts and materials. They had the potential value of around $2,000. Okay. However, there's a reality. When you're first starting out, a lot of guys aren't going to pay $2,000 for a guitar from somebody they've never heard of before. So I had to eat it on the labor cost. And what I did was I was just charging enough to slightly more than cover the cost of the parts and materials so I can at least make some profit, but I, I was still losing a lot in labor. And as I've told people in my videos about don't sell yourself short, one of the things you don't want to do in the very beginning, you should, but don't dwell on it is how much that guitar is worth based on your hourly wage for building. Cause you'll find out your hourly wage is dropping down to less than $2 an hour when you have to eat those labor costs. But once you start to build a reputation and can start to raise your pricing and at the same time, look for ways to reduce your labor cost. So that instead of taking two weeks to build a guitar, it takes you maybe three or four days, then you can start to really recoup that labor cost and enjoy more of a profit because instead of building one guitar every two weeks, you're building two or three guitars every two or three weeks. Yeah. It's almost at the beginning, you were investing in client base or testimonials are just the reputation. Or yeah, the exactly. And YouTube played a big part of that because I started to see my subscriptions going up and I, I try not to focus too much on subscriptions, but that's an indicator of your reputation. And it's to the point now where I can comment on another guitar builder's Instagram photo and they'll say, oh, I know who you are. So I'm starting to get that reputation or I've had the reputation out there for a moment and just trying to maintain and build off of it as much as I can. You mentioned that you sell plans as well. And then you're doing YouTube. Did you ever want to just going to build guitars? Like that's going to be my main thing. Or you always liked having these other kind of additional ways to bring in income. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in having as many revenue sources as you can, because in the world of building guitars which is tied into the availability of parts and materials. I wanted to have other sources of revenue, other revenue streams that I wouldn't necessarily live off of them, but they would be there to help support my business. You'll find that with building guitars, the market isn't what it was back in like the seventies, eighties, and nineties. That's when the baby boom generation was spending money on guitars playing and recording with guitars, but now that they've reached the retirement age, the generations that are coming up behind them are, they're more about, you know, this thing rather than learning how to play a guitar. So the numbers aren't there the way they used to be. It's, and I've noticed recently there's been a little bit of a resurgence. And we'll see where that goes. But I really felt it was necessary to broaden into helping people who want to build their own guitars, because that's a part of the whole maker movement and the DIY movement, which is going pretty strong. And people are looking for, especially with the lockdowns, looking for projects that they can do at home. So I wanted to, to try to be there to help with that, building guitars and teaching people how to do it selling plans it's, it's worked for your guitar like physical guitar customers that are buying them where were they coming from was it like your online presence was it local oh it's all online, online. Budget, all i've it. had a couple of locals but the internet is such a broad reach that and and the thing is back in like the 70s 80s and 90s you would have maybe 500 decent guitar players in the city of denver all of whom were always looking for guitars but now that number has shrunk down. So you've got to go way further out. And I was selling internationally for a while, but I ended up having to, to back away from selling internationally. And I just focused on selling throughout the continental United States. 
that's worked out fairly well. I, I would like to get back to international. They're going to have to change a lot of, of rules about shipping around the globe before I'm going to go back to doing that because it's an absolute nightmare, as I'm sure Inventables knows, selling CNC machines. Yeah, yeah. Guitars are not small to, to ship. Not only that, but the materials are, many of them are restricted. Yeah, your uh, certain species of mahogany, all your rosewoods, all your ebonies. So I had one guitar that was supposed to be shipped to England, and this is when I quit. They claimed, uh, customs claimed it had a rosewood fretboard, which it didn't. It did not have a rosewood fretboard, but I didn't have any proof that it wasn't rosewood. So customs said, if it looks like rosewood, it's rosewood. We're confiscating it. So they confiscated it. Now, fortunately, eBay not only refunded the customer's money, but they let me keep the money that the customer paid. And the guitar just disappeared. Never saw it again. So I quit doing international. I never would have even thought about restricted. That makes sense. That's crazy. Okay. So going to how uh, a little more Inventables came into the picture, I think I saw your like, hey, I got an X car video yeah. way back in 2015. Does that sound about right? That's, yeah, that's about right. I was part of that group that Inter that Inventables reached out to and offered to send a, an X card, the original X card, in exchange for an honest evaluation. And at the time, I had been thinking how it would be really ideal to bring CNC into my workshop because that would be a key way to reduce the labor costs by uh, shortening the amount of time it takes to build a guitar. And I knew the only way to do that would be CNC. I had done everything else I could to reduce my labor costs, the next step was going to be CNC. But at the time, as I was doing research, CNC was, it was still too complicated and expensive. But then uh, Inventables came along with this X car, which was a whole different approach to CNC. And I thought, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to try this. So I accepted the X car original, set it up started using it and I could tell right away, wow, this is a game changer. And it was. What were the, the first things I guess you started making with it? Was it like profiles of the bodies or? I was doing out? pretty much everything. I knew that easel couldn't do three dimensional, um, tool paths and G codes, but I knew I learned how to use Rhinoceros 3D so I could create those type of paths, but I could bring them into easel. And so I was able to do my fretboards, my neck, and the body. And I did everything. There was a little bit of a learning curve in terms of adjusting the belts and the V-wheels and getting everything to run just right. But once I had that done, I was able to start banging out necks and fretboards and bodies. And with that original X-Carve, I was reducing the time it took to build a guitar substantially. So like with a body using the old traditional way with the bandsaw and the router was taking me two, eight hour days to make a complete body to the point where it would be sanded. Once I had that X carve up and running, I cut that down to a single eight hour day. I cut the time in half. And right then I thought, okay, this is definitely the, the way to go as far as reducing that, that production time and reducing the labor cost. For other business owners that have just brought a CNC to the shop, are there any tips you'd give them on ways to think about it? Like, this is how you can set it up, or here are some tips just when you're trying to put out a lot of product? With, with the original X car, I think the key was understanding the limits of the machine, how fast you could carve into wood, how deep you could carve into it. And what I did when I create a guitar, I'll do a layout of the body, the neck, and the fretboard. And I'll look at each of the components and I do these drawings, I'm using Adobe Illustrator and I'll set it up full size, full scale, but then I'll look at each element, the, the body and the neck and the fretboard separately. And what I'll do is, is I'll look at those elements and decide what can I carve using just straight two dimensional carving and easel. And then what elements do I need to build a 3D model and set up my other tool paths? But this is one of the nice uh, features with Easel Pro is the ability to create a project with all your pages across the bottom of the screen. I will set those up in the order that they're going to be done. And you have to visualize that whole process from start to finish 
and you find yourself moving pages around, which is another nice thing that they did with Easel Pro is that ability to move pages around because you will find that certain operations have to be done before others. And if you can walk yourself through it in your mind, you can start to place those pages in an order that makes sense. And then you can move quickly through the entire process. So right now for a typical guitar build, I'll have at least a dozen pages, each one a different cutting operation from making the fretboard to making the neck and then making the body itself. The most important tip I can give is having that ability to visualize what's going to happen when you start to carve. That way you can set up your workflow in such a way that makes sense and is going to yield success rather than have so many guys I see are, they run out to Home Depot and they buy those big sheets of that pink polyurethane foam and they'll cut mock-ups with it to see what's going to happen. And that sort of works, but there's a big difference between foam and mahogany. And when you start to make those cuts into hardwood, everything kind of changes. Did you ever change how you approach the actual design around the tool? Like you mentioned, like the 2D and the 3D tool pass, but would you ever be like, oh, I, I can't use like this thickness of a bit to get this radius of, of whatever turn I want? Yes, it does. Like and in fact, there have been occasions where I'll set up a cut and I'll start to make it. And as I'm starting to make the cut, I'll think, oh, wait, that bit's not long enough. I've got to stop this right now or the, the spindle's going to plow right into the wood. So sometimes those kind of things will escape detection. I think it'd be cool down the road if Easel Pro can have a feature where you would tell it the length of your bit. So if that exceeds the thickness of the material, you're going to get a warning <laughs> because I've had that happen a couple of times. In terms of design, there are times when I'll look at a shape that I'm going to cut and I'm going to say, okay, if I make that cut with a quarter inch diameter bit, when it gets into the corner, I'm going to have a quarter inch radius. So maybe I want to think of a two pass carving operation so that I would switch bits to clean up that corner to get more of the sharp rather than the rounded. Things like that, that I come across as I'm planning a project. How do you work still with traditional power tools along with the CNC? Because I'm sure you're not getting a fully finished guitar right off the, uh, the CNC. It's getting really close. Is it really? Okay. I'll tell you, when I was using the original X-Carve, there were operations that I thought, you know what, I can do this faster if I just take the, the neck over to the drill press and drill the tuner holes. That made sense. And there were some other, like I was just mentioning about cleaning up a, a rounded corner with a two-pass carving. Sometimes it's easier just to grab a chisel or a file and tweak that a little bit. But with the X-Carve Pro, and, and especially like with Easel Pro, now you can drill holes. So I can set up operations where it's drilling tuner holes, it's drilling neck mounting holes, bridge mounting holes, all that stuff that I used to do by hand. It, it now just makes sense to do it with the x Pro. So I'm moving more and more away from combining the hand operations and, and really I think part of justifying uh, the purchase of an x Carve Pro is you want to be able to do everything. Because like I tell people, listen, you can pick between equipping your shop with a bandsaw and a drill press and planers and joiners, or you can maybe think about just getting an x Carve Pro. You're going to spend the same amount of money at the end, but you'll end up with a machine that can do certain incredible things that those other tools just are not going to do. I guess the x Pro decision, kind of what went into that? Because you had built your own custom CNC, right? Yeah, when I had the original x -Car, I it was just like, this is where it's going. And, and if you're not going to jump on board with this technology, you're going to be left way in the dust. And at the time, I, was, I had really run that x -Car into the ground. In three years, I just punished it. So I was going to do an upgrade, but when I started looking at the cost and everything I was going to have to do, I thought, let's design and build one. And this will become one of my YouTube video series type projects. And I could also create a plan for it and sell it on my eGuitar Plans website. So that's what I did. And I'd use that machine for a couple of years, but it was slightly better than the original X-Carve, but 
I didn't realize how much better it could get until I got the X-Carve Pro. And then it, it's like starting over in a whole new realm of capability. And it's just been night and day compared to what I used to have. So is it just that you can run it at like higher frequency? Yeah, I look at the X-Carve Pro in combination with Easel Pro. It's a one-two punch. The first punch is the X-Carve Pro. Its strength and its power, it allows me to increase those speed rates and depth of cut dramatically more than what I was able to do with my old machine by at least double. I'm carving guitar bodies at 150, 160 inches per minute, whereas with my previous machine, I couldn't go much beyond 80 inches per minute. Depth of cut is equal to the diameter of the bit. So a quarter inch bit is a quarter inch depth of cut. And that I know I could do a lot more. With my old machine though, it was barely a 16th of an inch and anything faster was just too much for it. So with the new X-Carve Pro, this is a dramatic increase in speed. But then the second punch is Easel Pro. And this is probably something that a lot of people haven't thought about. But with CNC technology, most people these days still think that it is really only useful in high-speed repetitive manufacturing. In truth, because the software is getting so much easier to use, we can do a lot more so much more easily than we could in the past. And that's one of the reasons why I stopped doing custom builds for people, because now I want to focus on my custom builds, but I want every guitar that I build to be unique, original, and one-off. Well, CNC doesn't really make sense for that in the old way of thinking, but with easier to use software, we can do it. And I'm doing it on every guitar. They're unique, they're different, they're one of a kind because I can create the files so fast and go right to carving. So that's the second punch is that shortening or leveling out that learning curve for the software, which has so, been so difficult, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, I've heard that too, just from folks that are just doing customized cutting boards, something pretty simple, but just the fact that you can change the name. So it's not the same thing, but that personalization of it just you just can do it a lot faster with, with a robot helping you yeah. versus having to do it. Cool. I know a lot of guys who in the years past, a lot of other small shop luthiers who decided to take the CNC plunge and, and they would see videos and they would hear people talk about it. So they go out and buy this machine, set it up. But then when they would try to tackle the software, they gave up because it was too much for them. And I tell people before you buy a CNC machine, um, Download some demos of the software and get a feel for it before you make that decision. But the software is getting so much easier. I can create a body in 20 minutes and then I can throw it in the mesh, do a tool path from the 3D shapes, then save out the SVG portions, bring those into easel, create the pockets that I need, and I'm ready to go. So if I decide I want to do a Les Paul style guitar one day, I can do that or I can do a Stratocaster style guitar the next day or a V-shaped guitar. There's no limitation there anymore. But it used to be it was so complicated to use the software that a guy would spend days and days creating the body files. And once he was done, they would just keep making that over and over and over instead of customizing it and tailoring it for different situations. So that's where I see CNC is really changing is having that ability to do that one-off things one-off designs, and that's going to be key for my business going forward. Hey, let's say I come to you today. I want a Les Paul. I've always wanted a Les Paul. How long would it take, assuming you had the materials? If I have no files to start with, it's probably going to take me a couple of days to build the body, the back, and the fretwork files. And it doesn't take me very long at all because I have so many previous examples that I can tweak and modify. Once it's done, We'll say I do that on a Thursday and a Friday, take the weekend off. Then on Monday, we start to cut. So on Monday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, I'm going to throw a fretboard blank onto the X car. And by nine, nine 15, it's done. So I'll set that aside. Then I'll get my neck blank, clamp that down. And probably by lunchtime, the neck is finished. In the afternoon, I'll grab 
a body blank, clamp that down, and I'll carve that out probably by two, say three o'clock in the afternoon. While that's carving, I'm standing at a workbench next to the X card. I'm inserting the truss rod into the neck and then gluing the fretboard to the neck itself. So then by the end of the day, my neck is clamped and, and the glue is drawn. Body is done. So if I've got a couple hours left in the day, I'll liberate the body from the blank, cutting the tabs. And I'll take it over to my oscillating spindle sander. This is one of those tools that's outside of the CNC, if it's necessary. I'm finding with the X-Carve Pro, I can do finishing passes that do an amazing surface finish. So that all I need to do is just some white 220 grit sanding. And then the body's done. I can start to apply grain filler, my dyes, stains, and whatever finish I'm going to apply to it. The next day, I take the clamps off the neck, and I can insert the neck into the body. And once that's done, I can then start to apply my finish. So really, by Wednesday or Thursday, I'm applying the finish on the body and the neck and pressing in the frets and getting that ready. And then by Friday, maybe the following Monday, I'm doing final assembly. Tuesday and Wednesday set up, making sure everything plays correctly. And then at that stage, because of the nature of stringed instruments, I'll hang the guitar for a couple of weeks and let it, the wood and the strings and the tension and all that settle in. We're talking about a week and a half to two weeks to fully complete a guitar. And if I do my schedule, I can do this multiple guitars at the same time. So I do one guitar on Monday, another on Tuesday, and then just kind of work back and forth between them all. Four or five guitars can be done. Yeah, so that, that's crazy. Yeah, to have uh, the finished, like actually hanging up. I, I wasn't even thinking about all the, the finished work. I'm sure it has to take a while to drive, but. Yeah, yeah from, actually, uh, that's another one of those uh, areas where I'm looking for ways to reduce the labor cost because finish could take a huge amount of time. So I've switched over from oil and solvent-based finishes to modern high-tech water-based finishes which can be ready to buff out in a day. So that saves a tremendous amount of time. So another area I've seen you use XR, it's not just around making the finished product, but I saw you're making tools with the CNC. I made an aluminum fretboard radius sanding bead. Yep. I don't know if you know this, but fretboards on a guitar they're not flat they may look flat but they have a very slight radius and that can vary anywhere from a seven and a quarter inch radius all the way up to about a 20 inch radius to fine tune it to get it absolutely perfectly straight and true you have to use a long radius sanding bead and uh, i bought a slab of aluminum half inch thick four inches wide i think it was like 20 inches long and I, I clamped it down to the XCAR Pro and carved that radius along its entire length so I could make my own radius sanding bead. And when you look up the cost of an aluminum, an extruded aluminum radius sanding bead, they're really expensive. I paid $20 for the chunk of aluminum and made it myself. And I've made a couple of other tools as well. I, I had a guy give me grief for making that radius sanding beam on the CNC machine. He says, you need to show people how to make tools by hand. I said, watch, I've got a CNC machine. That doesn't, wouldn't make sense at all to do. Yeah, it's funny because you're in the, the online world too. So you get the, all the YouTube comments, which, oh, are, yeah. which are really fun. But I always find like the mindset of someone doing this as a hobby versus doing this to make money a shift when like, I've got these tools, I'm going to use them. To their full potential yeah when you go into some of the woodworking supply stores when you start adding up the cost of all the tools that you need you very quickly are in the realm of the new x carve and you could certainly get close to the cost of an x carve pro and rather than fill your shop with all these different machines you could just eek out a little corner to put your x carve pro that whole world is changing and i've also noticed that a lot of these woodworking shops their displays of CNC stuff is growing rapidly. Okay, so last question. So you walk through the process of building a guitar, but if you were to start this business again, 
would you go about it in the same way? If, if someone was wanting to start a business making instruments or just building, how would you no. it, or what advice would you give? When I first started out, I was captivated by the romance of building things by hand, carving it out with a chisel and using files and spoke shades and all that stuff. And there was definitely that mindset among guitar players and guitar builders. That's how you have to build a stringed instrument was just by hand, the artisanal way. But the labor involved, there was no way I could compete with guitars that are being made overseas and imported into the United States. There's just no way I could compete with that. And in the beginning, when I first was building, those guitars were junk. So building a guitar by hand made sense. But now so many of those guitars coming from overseas are of such good quality that I've had to find a different way to be competitive. And what I've done is I have taken the, the X-Carve Pro and its strength, its power, and its precision, coupled with the ease of Easel Pro, and now I'm looking at being able to build one-off, truly custom, boutique, heirloom-quality guitars, but at a fraction of the price of what my competition is charging for them. Because when you look at a guitar that has all kinds of engraving, all kinds of inlay, a lot of times those guitars are priced anywhere from five to $10,000. And a lot of your younger guitar players, they're just not going to spend that. They can't afford it. The other day I did a complex inlay design on a fretboard. It took me three minutes to cut the inlay design. It took another probably 25 minutes to cut the pocket. Then I held my breath and I took that piece of inlay, flipped it over and pressed it in to the pocket and it just snapped right in. There were no gaps. It was perfect. So what used to take me hours and hours, we're talking several days of tedious mm -hmm. cutting with a jeweler saw and routing by hand took me less than 35 minutes to do it with the X car. That's a game changer. And when you realize it can do that, that is exactly the sort of thing. If I had known that was going to be possible 20 years ago, I would have jumped on it. But at the time it wasn't possible. Now it is. So if I was starting my business today, there are a lot of tools I have in my shop. I wouldn't even bother looking at. In fact, I've started getting rid of some of the tools because I just don't use them anymore. Looking at how guitars are priced. And what I can sell them for here in the United States and what the competition overseas is selling. But what I am now capable of doing, yeah, I would have gone down the CNC path a long time ago if that had been available at the times. So. How would you get customers if you didn't have any presence or anybody didn't know about you? What would you do? Would you start creating videos and sharing again or? Yeah, absolutely. I think the internet and its capabilities are hard to deny. And my dad, he was involved in a lot of marketing and advertising. And he used to tell me when I was a kid, if you want to sell something, you go to where the people are. And the people are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, a whole host of other ones. And that's where you can go to get the most bang for your buck. In fact, I don't really spend any money on social media advertising. I just post my videos and a couple of promos for those videos on Twitter. And that's really all I'm doing right now. I could probably do more. I'm happy so far with how it's worked out. But I think for a lot of folks who don't have that, that marketing background, who haven't created websites and don't know social media strategy, they're going to have to look at having someone help them do that. It's not automatic. Don't take what I've done as as a, a good way to necessarily do it because I have that background. That might be something that, in, that Inventables can consider offering as a service to some of the folks who are starting a business around the XCAR Pro is a ways to help them market that business to recoup the cost of that machine. We definitely want to help not just on the what you do with the machine, but the whole business that, that you create with it. That's definitely one of the big, big focuses uh, moving forward for us. But also like you, you mentioned, you got to go where the people are and you had mentioned reverb. There's going to be some type of unique community around whatever product you're making. 
somewhere that you can yeah. find and get plugged into. And like I mentioned, Reverb is great. And for people that aren't familiar, it's uh, like a used instrument seller. Is that how you describe it's it? It's everything instruments. It's used instruments. It's brand new, custom made parts. I don't know if people can offer services through it. Yeah, I see a lot of brand new parts that are up for sale. If you're a, a music store in you know Denver, Colorado, and you want a broader reach than just your community, you can sell your parts and accessories on Reverb. So they do pretty much everything. I appreciate you, you taking the time and chatting. It's always fun to catch up uh, with all the, the crazy things that you're building. Looking forward to see all the stuff you make with XCar Pro and the videos you put and you out. You guys are going to see something hopefully in the next month. And it's a secret project that I've been working on. Can't say anything about it right now, but it will be a, a pretty impressive project. So. That's all I can say on it. Um, so stay tuned. Everyone stay tuned. For people that are listening, that do want to check you out, is the website, is that the best place you send them or just Highline Guitars all over? Yeah, um, Highline Guitars, it's a, a website that's in flux because when I got the X-Carve Pro and started using it and realized what this was going to mean for my business, I quickly jumped onto my website and rearranged a few things. I have a bunch of empty spots where there will be guitars for sale. I just haven't gotten there yet. That's one of the pitfalls of doing everything yourself. <laughs> one minute you're running the CNC machine, cutting your guitar body. The next minute you're working on a website. And then the next minute you're editing video. So <laughs> and I'm a jack of all trades, a one man band, so to speak. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces to do it. But, but that uh, or we'll my Highland Guitars YouTube channel. So got it. Cool. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, and chatting with me. All right. Great.